Hey, what's happening? Hey, how's it going? <laughs> <laughs> I've already messed it up. <laughs> we can edit stuff too, thank God, because I screw up all the time. <laughs> Hey, what's happening? This is Miles Kennedy with On The Record and Ultimate Guitar. Thank you so much for taking the time to chat with us today. We are here to chat about your uh, new solo record, your third solo record. It's coming out uh, October 11th, I believe. Uh, the Art of Letting Go. Um, just kind of give us a little rundown of uh, the, your experience putting this record together. Basically, I talked to uh, the powers that be and I realized that I had a window uh, coming up third quarter last year to make an album. So um, I got to work, you know, I was on the road and I was touring and, and with Alter Bridge and just uh, started tackling song ideas for about six months. And uh, fortunately, you know, as a songwriter, you're always hoping that you've still got something left in the well. And, uh, you know, got in the studio around October of last year and, and, and made the album. As I understand it, this is a little... Uh, less cohesive of an album as far as having like a linear line going through it. It's it's less of a concept album. Is that fair to say? Yeah, it's definitely a collection of, of songs, uh, kind of snapshots of the moment. Um, I felt like I'd done that enough on previous records where there were um, concepts that were explored on each song to, to, tie, to tie the entire thing together. Um, but with that said, you know, this record, it's funny now that I've lived with it for a while, I realized that a lot of a lot of the material it does fall in line with this idea of the art of letting go. You know, it does, it does in different, different, uh, dynamics, but the, but the need to, um, kind of evolve in that particular arena and, and not be, it could in some ways, you know, not be, be as reactive, uh, you know, be more present all the way down to the very last song, which is the idea of, you know, not uh, being so passive, you know, and learning to um, not avoid conflict as much and let go of that need to be such a people pleaser. So letting go is definitely a theme that runs throughout, but I wouldn't say it's a concept record. Is there a song that challenged you most, either as a songwriter or a guitar player? Um, yeah, I would say the song that probably challenged me the most just because I realized that it was it was an important, it was an important idea was this, the, the lead, the single, the, the original, you know, say what you will. Um, when I stumbled up, stumbled onto that initial idea, which was definitely uh, heavy on the Mark Knopfler influence, uh, I really liked it. I just thought, I just thought it had something special and it was a good hook, but I threw a lot of different riffs and different uh, verses at it until I finally felt like it was ready to, to be documented. So that was a, uh, you know, that was definitely a, 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 it took a few months for me to finish that track until I was happy. You know, we're Ultimate Guitar. This is a very guitar-centric record, as, as most of your material has been, but uh, definitely a lot of seeing your chops as a guitar player on there. Is there a song that maybe pushed you as far as technical uh, guitar playing on this record? Um, Technically, I would say that... You know, there's a song, the, the second to the last song, uh, um, Dead to Rights, uh, which is a tip of the hat to my buddy. The, the, musically, it's a tip of, my, tip of the hat to my buddy, Ian Thornley. And, um, and one of the intentions initially was to have, I was going to reach out to him and have him play a slide solo on it because I, I love his slide playing. Well, I, it, when I texted him that I was making, you know, recording this track, um, I realized he was on the road, he was touring and there's no way he was going to be able to track it. So I was, became painfully aware that, that the solo was, I was going to be up to me to, to, uh, you know, play that solo myself. And so that was, it was a fun challenge. I mean, I love playing slide guitar. Um, but I definitely, you know, was trying to channel my, my, my inner in on that one. Um, and, uh, it was fun. I'm, I'm happy with how it turned, with how it turned out. And as far as gear, what, uh, did you change things up from previous solo records or what you're using in Alter Bridge? Obviously, since last time we talked, you, ha you now have a PRS signature, uh, T style, we'll call it maybe, uh, guitar that I love, by the way, that's a beautiful guitar. 
thank you for bringing it to the masses and making it a production <laughs> model. Um, but is that kind of what you were relying on as far as uh, guitars in the studio? Yeah, that was that. What you hear is is all the PRS MK signature. Yeah, it's that right into a to a, a diesel Paul amp, and that's uh, I kept it very simple, something I could recreate live, as opposed to previous records I'd done first in the solo realm where I was using a bunch of vintage gear that I had. Um, yeah, and, and I literally took the main guitar just right out of the box i was i all my stuff was in storage and i was like i need to find a guitar to make this record so i had him ship me a few and i just you know <laughs> i found the one i liked just pulled it out of the box and had my tech set it up and that's it so i'm, I'm thrilled with how it turned out so out of the box what what sort of things do you have your tech do to kind of make it your own as far as guitar setup what do you like i like i don't like the action to be too low I don't like it to be too high. I like just that just right. Um, give a little bit of a, you know, get a little bit of relief to the neck, you know, adjust the truss rod somewhat. Um, but that's about it. You know, I use my Diodario, uh, I think we use 10 through 46. Uh, and depending on the tuning, if I'm doing it, to, you know, uh, something heavier, uh, like a lower tuning, like on Dead to Rights, that track, I, the low D, because it's an open G, but I tune it down to C, uh, or tune the, the just just the, the the low D down to C, which kind of a, it's kind of a strange tuning. Um, that I put a heavier gauge string on, um, and then if it's tuned to pitch, like it, so I'm half step down with everything. But if I'm tuned to pitch, I'll put on nine and a half because it's a twenty five and a half inch scale, so it's a little bit more tension. And I, you know, I find with my, my fragile little digits here, I like those nine and a half at, at standard tuning. So uh, I did want to ask you, uh, again, that guitar came out since the last time we talked. And uh, can you kind of take us through the design process of that with, with you and the folks at PRS and maybe some of the subtle differences um, where it maybe started out as a kind of a nod to the Fender Telecaster, which you've been known to play those in the past as well. What's, what sort of tweaks did you do for your signature model? Yeah, so we started about two years prior to when it was released, and I was really honored that they were, A, interested in having me <laughs> be part of a signature guitar, but more importantly, they were they asked me to be involved with designing this guitar. It wasn't just like they took an existing guitar and were going to put my name on it. So I was I was over the moon about the, the prospect of doing something like that, because I always had like things that I dreamed of trying to incorporate into a guitar, you know, all my favorite elements and how would that work? And they were so willing to explore all of that, you know? Um, yes, I do love T-Styles. Um, you know, I have uh, a few in the, in the collection. I'm, I'm very fond of Blackguards in particular. Um, and so I, I wanted to take certain elements from, from those. A lot of it was like the, the way the neck felt, uh, like those old Tadio Gomez necks um, that just have that whatever that mojo is, man, that's, it's just something really, really special. So, um, once we had the, um, I feel like the, the overall vibe of the, of the neck and, and the dimensions of the guitar, um, and then the, the pickup, that was really important as well because we wanted it to have those sonic characteristics of a single coil, but at the same time, you don't want all the noise, especially when I'm playing in these high gain environments, like with, with alter bridge. And, and now with the solo stuff, it's a, it's a little more, not as high gain, but it's, it's higher than it was, you know, in previous records within the solo world. Um, so having those narrow field pickups that cancel out the harm was really paramount, you know? Um, but it was, uh, you know, I, what I learned from the process was just how, how much goes into the research and development of an instrument when you're building it from the ground up, you know, and we, we spent a lot of time on it. I had a great time working with, with Rich and in there. And we, we, you know, we, we both got really close over the whole process. Obviously Paul, <clears throat> Paul is known forever. And, and he was so passionate about things. you know, Paul's, Paul's passion for instruments is, is, you know, it's, it's really something to behold. <laughs> you know, he just, especially as long as he's been in the game, it's so inspiring and, and Bev and everybody at the, at the company were just amazing to work with. So, I consider that one of the highlights of my, my career, for sure. What was your first PRS, and how did you get hooked up with them? You've been playing PRSs for quite a while. Yeah. Um, it was in 1998. 
And I knew I loved PRSs because I used to work at a music store, and occasionally one would come to the store, and we'd all those guitar nerds would just, you know, drool. Um, but it seemed kind of unattainable. You know, it was just such a nice instrument, and at the time, I you know I could barely rub two pennies together, so that seemed totally out of reach. Um, but yeah, when I got I got the I was with a band called the Mayfield Four, and we got our first label, major label deal, and so we were playing at CBGBs in new york and, and our manager went down the street and bought a, a, a mccarty bought the prs mccarty and he you know was just over the moon and he's like hey do you want to play it tonight at the show and i was like absolutely well long story short i was wearing this ring and at the end of the night i did like the pete townsend windmill and dinged up the entire that 10 top was never the same it was just a mess after after that one show so i ended up writing him a check the next day with, with my hard earned advance that i got from the record label and uh, and bought that guitar and i still have that guitar to this day um it's a, it's i still use it uh, on a i think i use it on open your eyes maybe i maybe i use it it's a beautiful red beautiful top but that's that's where it started and then when i started playing with alter bridge you know obviously through mark's uh connection with 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 the company that's how i got my foot in the door yeah i guess i always assumed that it, it was through mark but uh it's, it's interesting that you were playing prs before you got together yeah. with alter bridge so that that's kind of cool okay. speaking of mark have you seen the creed reunion any thoughts on on how they're sounding these days i have not been to a show i've just you know seen the uh all the, the the footage that's out there, and it sounds great. I'm happy for those guys. I think that um, you know it's definitely something that it's making a lot of people happy getting to hear those songs again. You got to consider there's there's a whole generation of people who've heard so many of those songs who never got to see them live. So anytime bands um, put together these tours after they've been a, away for a while and they can go back and revisit their legacy and their catalog, I think that's a good thing. You're also a singer. There's some great vocal parts on this record as well, which I, I think anyone who knows your work would not be surprised to hear that. Um, how do you keep your voice in such great shape? It sounds so young and so vibrant. It's the first time I heard you 20 years ago. Well, and I pre man, I appreciate hearing that more than anything. I'm glad it's still, I'm fooling people in, a, in how old I actually am. Um, but yeah, it's you know it's funny. I owe I owe most of that to the the guy who I studied with. I took like eighteen lessons from this guy named Ron Anderson, and I started with him through. Um, I was at the time I was being managed by uh, Silver Management, and they managed uh, like Alice in Chains and Soundgarden. This was back in the nineties, and so they put me in touch with with um, with Ron because he he was working with I believe he was working with Chris Cornell uh, and and. And he was really happy with how uh, all the things he was learning. So yeah, that was that was a really pivotal moment for me getting to getting to um, study with somebody like that. And I remember the first thing he told me in the first lesson. He says, "If you apply this technique, he goes, as you get older, your voice won't degrade. He, if you, but you have to really practice this and really learn what this technique is and put in the time. And so if someone's you know, tells a young singer something like that, you know, that's the best carrot to, to dangle in front of their face. So I, I got pretty intense with, with practicing the, uh, the scales and the arpeggios and learning the placement. And it's just all, it's an old opera technique. That's it's, it's, it's not like he was teaching something revolutionary to my understanding. I think if I remember correctly, it's like something that's been around for probably like 300 years. So I'm, I got to tell you at 25 years later, however long it's been, the fact that I can still, you know, sing and still hit the notes I I was hitting when I was 26, 27 years old. Uh, I attribute that to to meeting Ron. You know, I'm not going to take any credit for it. <laughs> it's just, it's just I lucked out and and got to study with one of the greats. Are we allowed to say what that technique is, or maybe some aspects of the technique? I would imagine there's a lot to it. I think if I'm not mistaken, I believe it's called bel canto. And, and really it's this idea of developing, going from your chest voice and, and into your head voice and making it as a smooth transition. So where you almost kind of, you, it, it looks and sounds effortless, but it's, I can assure you, it takes a lot of time to integrate to where you don't have to think about it anymore. And that for me has been the, the challenge, you know, and, and it's, it's, it's just like any technique, you know, where 
at first you're like, how am I going to do this? And how am I, how am I going to do this live and not, you know, trip up, you know, it's just like when you're learning as a guitar player, when you're learning alternate picking and you're like, how am I ever going to execute this, this technique and, and not trip all over myself? It's just, it's just through putting in your 10,000 hours, you know, just doing it over and over and over and over. So that's, that, that was the thing. And I think some of it is just, I've been so insanely lucky with how my career has turned out in that I was able to not just practice this in the, you know, at my house or in my studio or, or whatever, but also, I, you know, in the trenches, on the road, on stage, you know, I've played, I don't know, I can't even, I don't, I can't even take a stab at how many shows I've played at this point in my career. But um, and when you're, when you're up there and you have to apply this technique, night after night after night, eventually it just gets ingrained into your, it becomes automatic. And um, so, yeah, I'm, I'm stoked. <laughs> it worked. <laughs> Are there any songs that uh, were difficult to get down that maybe took a few more repetitions than other songs? I guess, what would be your most demanding vocal part that you've laid down in your career? In my career? Oh man, there are a lot. There are a lot that I curse as we're doing them and go, why did I do that? I painted myself into a corner on this one. Um, that's a good question. I mean, all of them have kind of different aspects that are, that are challenging. So, you know, there's something about the, the, the subtle, sometimes the subtle ones are the hardest ones. Um, sometimes the ones that are lower can actually be more of a challenge depending on just how my voice is feeling that night but obviously the high stuff you know when you're going for the really high notes um there there's a song in the in the uh in the catalog from a mayfield four record called uh summer girl and uh it's it's probably one of my favorite vocals and it was done in my basement i it's it, we took the demo and just flew it onto the in, onto the actual album because we knew we weren't going to top the vocal um and that was that was challenging from an emotional standpoint and to, to, to fast forward to blackbird blackbird's the same thing it's 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 more about the gravity of the lyric and what i'm as opposed to the notes themselves it's it's what is being conveyed emotionally and doing that night after night can really can be taxing because when you're writing a song when you sing a song about losing someone uh who's no longer with us to you know, and try and do that in a way that's honest and you're putting yourself out there and, and, and really diving into those emotions night after night. Yeah, that can be emotionally taxing. Is there anything in the works? Uh, obviously, you're going to be touring on this solo stuff through the fall and into the spring. Um, very excited about that. Uh, is there any uh, work with Alter Bridge or Slash or any other of your many, many projects? <laughs> <laughs> the 10,000 projects. Yeah, we're trying to figure out schedule-wise how we can fit in the next projects, the next records. It's just a matter of um, carving out a window um, where it works for everybody. And I think just given how everybody's playing in all of these bands now, <laughs> you know, it's becoming more and more problematic for our poor agents and managers, but we always seem to figure it out. So, uh, and what's it like writing with Slash uh, compared to, as we've said, you have you have a lot of projects. Uh, how does writing with him kind of size up to other projects that you do as far as the collaborative process. Yeah, it's a different process. Uh, with Slash, uh, he will present like a, a, a good foundation uh, from a musical stand, standpoint. Uh, the um, like the riffs and the chord progressions are all pretty much in place. Um, and then I'll put the melody on top of that and then add the lyric. But occasionally something will come up and, and I'll be like, hey, can we change this chord progression here so it would better suit the melody? And he's always totally cool with that. It's never, it's never, one of, one of the things I love about writing with him is he's, he's not precious with his ideas. He's always willing to serve the song, which is awesome. Um, whereas with Alter Bridge, it's, you know, bringing, I'll bring in, um, you know, demos of, of, of tracks and, uh, you know, have the, the, foundation set and have the melody along with the guitar parts and chord progressions riffs whatnot um and mark will do the same he'll have he'll bring in his ideas and then there will be other songs where we'll put our parts together put the put the um various you know do you have a bridge that works with this chorus and do you have a riff so that's that's 
fun as well because it's like a sonic uh it's like a sonic puzzle you know um so yeah it just it really depends and then when in the solo realm then i'm just doing it all, all by myself lonely me <laughs> <laughs> so when you're writing music i would imagine it's kind of a constant process for you being an artist that's what you do you create art um, and, and you're always being creative. Uh, is it difficult sometimes to suss out, this is going to be a solo song, this is going to be an alter bridge song, this might work really well with Slash, those sort of things? Generally, it's pretty easy. We, I'm not as worried with, with Slash because it's a different process. So since he'll present the, the foundation to me for, you know, before I'll start my work, that's, that's easy. Because I'm not going to say, hey, Slash, I've got an, a riff I think you should use. I'm, I'm just... Look, the guy's a, he's a genius when it comes to riffs. I'm not I'm not even gonna step step foot in that territory. Um it's 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 more challenging with Alter Bridge because of just how we the process, right? So certain things might up you might come up with an idea and, and think, oh, that's kind of riding the fence there. That that could possibly end that could possibly be an Alter Bridge song. Um and and vice versa, that the same thing is happening where I'm writing for Alter Bridge and there might be an idea that I'll set aside for a solo thing. Um, so yeah, it's, it's, it's definitely, it's definitely different. And I will say that with this record, because it's more of a riff based record and, and the, it's louder guitars and, and whatnot, I was definitely aware of how there would be, um, similarities and, and how to avoid that. And I think the, the main thing is that with, with Alter Bridge, it's more about, it's heavier and it's, 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 we use a lot more drop tunings and it's, and it's at times there's almost like a, a, a metal vibe. Um, but in the solo realm, there's, there's none of that. And um, it's more, there's more role, less rock, you know, as Keith Richards would say, you know, I'm really, I'm, I'm, I'm focusing more on the groove and a certain pocket in the solo realm, especially on this record. Now in the first two, those were totally different, but with Alter Bridge, it's about the, you know, kind of the, the, it, just the heaviness on a lot of the songs. And I try to be very careful in the soul, in especially making the art of letting go as to how heavy I would, or the kind of heavy I would allow myself to be, you know, I, a riff like the one on, um, I say dead to rights, you know, that's drop tuning and, it, and one could consider that heavy, but it's still very much in the blues realm. Right. And that wouldn't work. A riff like that wouldn't work in, in Alter Bridge. As long as we're talking about musical differences between projects like Alter Bridge and your solo career, are there some, I would imagine there's some business differences as well, touring with a machine like uh, like Slash or, or Alter Bridge and doing a solo tour. Are solo tours a little bit more viable these days than, than touring with a big band? Or is there some, some things that you've noticed, some differences between touring as a solo artist and touring uh, with a band like Alter Bridge? Yeah, well, touring as a solo artist, uh, for, at least for me at this point, you know, you're starting, I'm starting over, you know, I'm building the brand from the ground, brand from the ground up. So, you know, I'm not rolling with a semi, I'm not rolling with multiple buses and um, it's stripped down, but that's great because it's a different experience for me. It's a different experience for um, for the people who show up to the show. Um, and I really like that because then when I step back into Alter Bridge world or with, with Slash, it makes me appreciate the, the magnitude of those tours and the amount of production we're taking out. And, and the, it's a more, you have a lot more crew and, and, um, and more people, you know, it's just, it's a different, it's a different animal. And I think for me, I have this incredible luxury to bounce around with all these different things where it never, nothing ever gets old. So it's like, I don't, I think it would become redundant if I was playing in three different bands that were playing arenas. You know, I would, one would say, well, that would be great. <laughs> but, but for me, the, the fact that I get to go back and play theaters and, and larger clubs with the solo thing is it's, it's awesome. It's, it's a, it's, it's a different, it's a totally different experience. So yeah, it's, it's something that uh, I, I don't take for granted. Well, I really appreciate the time you've you've given a, to us today and all the advice and uh, all the music you've given to us through the years, man. I really appreciate oh, it. Thank you. And I hope I hope my I hope my service I'm I'm all paranoid that I my I have bad internet here, but, but uh, hopefully you you got everything I said. Yeah. Yeah, absolutely. Um and for those watching this, uh 
I have listened to the record. It's fantastic if you're a fan of, of Miles and his previous work and guitar in general. You're going to love this record, so pick it up October 11th. So thank right you so on. much. Thank you very much, Justin. You take care, man. Yeah.